Uh, good evening and thanks for attending. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Rich Llewellyn. I'm one of the assistant chiefs here at Everett Fire. Uh, we're excited to be able to offer this educational opportunity tonight. And we do have a couple of ground rules that we want to discuss. I'm going to hand things over to Chief Dave DeMarco. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, just a couple of things. First, for the, for the on-duty Everett people that are in this, um, Dr. Shapiro is going to give a presentation with slides and, and take some questions over the course of the slides. Uh, for on-duty staff, obviously, you're available to answer alarms um, and that you're excused uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, the question and answer, the interactive question and answer will follow the presentation, and you're, of course, welcome to stay for that. But if you choose to uh, log off at that point, that's uh, perfectly fine. Um, for, for everyone who uh, chooses to interact with uh, Dr. Shapiro, um, first, we want to remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded uh, for training purposes. We're going to make, make the video available to those who have questions uh, after this meeting that weren't able to attend. Um, and so if you have a question, we just ask that you identify yourself by name and agency affiliation, uh, and then pose your question to Dr. Shapiro. Um, so I'll start by... Uh, thanking Dr. Shapiro. So Dr. Shapiro, is a, a, she'll give you her own um, professional descriptions, uh, but, but her time is profoundly valuable. She's a, an expert in her field. And we have been asked by our staff to uh, have the opportunity to, to interact with an expert and talk to uh, that expert about um, the vaccines, about the virus itself, about the illness, and, um, and, and Dr. Shapiro has very graciously volunteered to uh, answer those questions. Um, the only ask of, of people participating is, is that we not turn this into a, a political event. We, we, she's not here to address the governor's mandate. She's not going, going to address issues about whether it's uh, um, legal or whether there's uh, you know implications for civil liberties all of that will be dealt with by legal professionals she's here to talk about the the illness and the science behind the vaccines uh, and take questions uh, that you have related to those things and so with that um rich do you have anything you need to add uh, no we also have julie sartowski here and she will also get an opportunity to introduce herself she's been our liaison with fred hutch since we began our COVID antibody study with Everett Fire last year. So we'll let her introduce herself as well. Okay, so uh, we're gonna mute ourselves and, and step away. Dr. Shapiro, Julie, if you'd like to take a minute and introduce yourselves and then go ahead and get started. Thank you. That's so great. Julie, since you are the liaison and the, the known entity with this team, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself first and then I'll, I'll give my intro and jump into the presentation. Great, that sounds good. Thanks, Adrian, for um, being willing to do this. Uh, I'm, I can't see everybody, so I don't know um, how many of you may have met me. Uh, we've been working with the Everett Fire Department, uh, looking at um, if there was uh, infection in folks that had been exposed early on, and then those that have been infected following their antibodies over time, and those that haven't also following them over time. And it's just been a real pleasure and a real honor to work with this group. And so um, take it away, Adrian. Great, thanks so much, Julie. Julie is a, a nurse practitioner and researcher at the, at the Fred Hutch uh, the Vaccine Trials Unit and is, is the lead clinical um, uh, investigator on the, on the COVID cohort study that some of you may be a part of it, seen, seen the team around. Um, it has been a pleasure for me to work with Julie and to, to meet your department um, and the, the Snohomish County Department folks who are here. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I am Adrian Shapiro. I am an infectious diseases specialist uh, doctor. So I, uh, I see patients in clinic and in hospital um, with folks who have infectious diseases and I spend some of my time doing clinical work and some of my time doing research. So in addition to my clinical infectious diseases specialty, I also have a PhD in epidemiology and the research that I do when I'm not seeing patients includes virology, immunology, 
bacteriology and epidemiology. So all of the ologies, um, and it's a it's a real privilege to be able to uh, talk with with all of you about things that uh, I like you have spent the last year and a half working on, uh, just in in different ways. Um, in addition to the the research and the infectious diseases specialty work I do, I'm also a primary care doc in Everett. So I'm it's particularly nice for me. Uh, to be able to talk to Snohomish County folks. Uh, I see patients at Snohomish um, CHC at the Everett South location. And uh, so you guys are, uh, you folks are, are really my, my home territory. So I'm, I'm really glad to get this chance to talk with you. We're gonna go through some science. We're gonna go through some clinical questions. And I, I have these conversations with my patients every day in, that I'm in clinic. I'm so delighted to have them with you and I, I really welcome questions. Let's try to keep questions during the presentations to questions that are really like focused on what I'm talking about. And then if you have questions that I don't cover um, on topics I don't cover in the presentation, let's save those till the end. But I wanna make sure what I'm saying is clear and makes sense during the presentation. So please feel free to put your hand up um, during the presentation. So your chief uh, was kind enough to, uh, to ask you all to submit some questions that you had and went through the questions and figured out what are the, what are the top 10 questions that came up among um, the responses that came from the departments. So I, I got the list of the top 10 questions and the presentation is designed to, to hit on all of these. Um, and the way I saw it, looking at the presentation, they, they kind of fell into four buckets. So the questions really address a couple, four key themes of what really, what are the vaccines? What are they made of? How are they made? Where do they come from? So we're gonna talk about that. Then some really key questions, really important questions about are the vaccines safe? What are the risks of the vaccines? We will absolutely talk about that. Uh, some questions that really kind of got to, why are we even doing this? Why, why are we doing the vaccines? What are the vaccines, you know, how are they going to address the COVID-19 pandemic that has taken over our lives? And then I was so gratified to see that some questions really fell into the bucket of tell me more about infectious diseases and epidemiology. These are things I love to think about, love to talk about, and happy to, to share my thoughts um, that were conveyed. So these, these were how the questions kind of fell into the different buckets. Um, won't read through each one of them, but let's just dive right in to bucket number one. What are the vaccines? What are they made of? What's the difference between the three vaccines? And just so we're all clear for purposes of this discussion, we're going to be talking about the three vaccines that are uh, that have emergency use approval or FDA approval in the U.S. So that's the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, which are the mRNA vaccines, and the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, which is the um, an adenovirus vaccine. So one question that seemed to come up was, when were the mRNA vaccines developed? Um, a lot happened in the last year, but the mRNA vaccine development process has been going on for decades. So this is, this is just a table that comes from a, a, a journal article in 2018. So before there was any, any knowledge or um, any twinkle in any bat's eye that, uh, that COVID could be an issue. Um, this, this table lists all of the different mRNA viruses that were in, or sorry, mRNA vaccines that were in human trials. So these were not for COVID obviously, because COVID didn't exist yet as far as we knew, um, but there were mRNA vaccines that have been developed and were in phase one and two trials for HIV, for rabies, for Zika and influenza. And I'll just call folks' attention to the, to the bottom of the screen here. Moderna, the company Moderna, has been working on mRNA vaccines for years. Um, COVID's not their first mRNA rodeo. So they had, they had Zika virus and influenza virus mRNA vaccines in trials uh, back, in, back in 2018. And then this is a very busy slide. I'm uh, sorry about that but it just shows how far back the timeline goes for the development of mRNA vaccine. mRNA was, was discovered in 1961. And then by about 2001, there were the first trials of studies using mRNA technology in, um, 
in preventive or therapeutic efforts. So going back to 2001, there have been, um, and then maybe 2009 was the first mRNA um, clinical trial of a formulation. 2017 was the first, uh, first in human test of mRNA vaccines looking at cancer. So just to say, these timelines show mRNA vaccines, uh, the technology and the, the research, the foundations go back a long time so that a lot of the platform was ready to go when COVID hit and the, the genome was rapidly sequenced in early 2020. And so they are able to, to plug in the key elements into a, a well-researched platform to develop the mRNA vaccines. So, so these mRNA vaccines that have been developed for you know, 20 odd years, how do, what are they and how do they work? So I'm gonna call your attention to start to the graphic on the left side of the screen here. So fundamentally mRNA vaccines um, use pieces of genetic material of the virus that give um, the blueprint instructions to make a piece of the virus. So mRNA contains the blueprint for making the spike protein of the coronavirus. The, the vaccine is given into the muscle, in the arm, then that piece of uh, mRNA, that piece of genetic material, which is shown here in another diagram, it's covered in what's called a lipid nanoparticle, which is basically fat cells that helps it get into um, cells in your body. And then that mRNA comes into a cell in your body and your body's cell machinery takes that mRNA, reads the blueprint, and reads the blueprint to make spike protein, spike protein that belongs to coronavirus. But in this case, it's just the protein, it's not the rest of the virus, so it can't cause any harm. Um, so the, once the virus enters the cell, um, the, your, the, the human cell uh, mechanism makes the protein and then displays that bit of uh, protein on the outside of the cell so that the immune system can see it, can learn to recognize it and form defenses against it. That way, when the actual virus encounters the immune system, it's all ready to go with its defenses. That, um, I should also just mention that the, the mRNA that gets introduced is destroyed within about 24 hours. So it doesn't hang around in the body. What hangs around is not even the spike proteins because those get made, but then they also get destroyed. What hangs around is the immune response and the, the vaccine itself um, disappears at, within hours to days. There's, there's no traces of, of what was originally there. So that's the way, that's the mRNA vaccine and that's the way both the, um, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines work, that same principle. The Johnson and Johnson vaccine is a little bit different. Um, it is, it, instead of using a, a piece of mRNA surrounded by fat cells to get into the body. Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine takes a piece of DNA, a different kind of genetic material from the coronavirus, puts it inside a weakened adenovirus. So a, a virus that causes the common cold, but has been engineered that it can't make people sick and it can't even replicate. So once it's dead, it's, you know, it, it can't make copies of itself to to cause um, more copies and it can't make you sick. So it, it really is just a vector, it's just a transportation mode. So it carries the, um, the adenovirus, which is this yellow spiky thing, carries the DNA into a human cell. The, the um, viral vector then sort of injects the DNA into the human cell. The DNA is turned into mRNA and then we're kind of back where we would be with an mRNA vaccine. So it all gets to the same point of, of our bodies reading that blueprint um, to make spike proteins to train the immune system. Um, but the adenoviral vector, the Johnson & Johnson, is delivered through an adenovirus, um, whereas the mRNA vaccine is delivered just in those fat particles as part of the vaccine. Other key differences between the vaccines, Johnson & Johnson is delivered as one, a single shot, um, whereas the mRNA vaccines are both delivered as a series of two shots as a, as a primary series uh, with three to four weeks in between. Um, 
on a practical level, the um, Pfizer vaccine is available for people age 12 and up, um, whereas Moderna and Johnson and Johnson are for aged 16, uh, 16 to 18 and up. Um, and there is um, there's some differences in how cold the storage needs to be to transport them. Um, but, but functionally, they all get you to the same place, which is having your body produce spike proteins um, to then train the immune system to recognize the invader, which is COVID when, when you recognize COVID in real life. And then there's some minor differences in, uh, in efficacy in, in how well each of them works. It's looking like the Moderna vaccine probably has the longest acting efficacy of all to prevent, um, to prevent serious infection, uh, serious disease. Uh, Pfizer's, but they're, I mean, they're all very good. They're all in the, the high 80s to 90s of preventing severe infection um, and hospitalization and death. Uh, they're all excellent, in fact, at preventing death. So importantly, none of them is 100% protective against getting infected in the first place, but because their job is to train the immune system to quickly respond and um, take down the virus once it gets into people, they all do a very, very good job of preventing an infection from, from causing illness. Uh, they also do all do a good job of, of preventing uh, infection, but the, the, the better, uh, the more reliable efficacy is preventing severe disease. All right, um, and then this is just a, a, a quick slide to highlight the fact that before, in the before time, before 2020, the development of a vaccine process took probably on the order of 10 years, whoops, in part because everything was done in sequence. So the basic research started and then trials in people, phase one, phase two, phase three, and then the vaccine would be licensed and then it would be manufactured and then it would be delivered. All of that, that entire process, every single one of those steps was done in developing the COVID vaccines we now have. It was compressed in a timeline because many of those steps were done simultaneously. So they started manufacturing vaccines before we knew which ones were going to work. Um, it was taking a gamble and with the hope that of the many that were going into trials, at least one would work out and then that would be, or those would be the ones that go forward. So that, that timeline was able to be compressed to less than a year, um, in part because a lot of the preclinical development, early lab science had, had been going on already. Um, and it was, it was easy to convert vaccine research for other diseases into vaccines for COVID and then compress that timeline with the, with the support of a lot of scientists. So some, some folks had questions about what's in the vaccines. And specifically, some folks were concerned about whether fetal cells from aborted fetuses are used in COVID-19 vaccines. So I want to be very clear, I've, I've got a table here showing each of the vaccines and no, none of the vaccines contain in themselves in the product that goes into your arm, none of them contains any fetal tissue from aborted fetuses or, or any kind of fetal tissue at all. All of the vaccines um, at some point in the development, usually in the very early, earliest um, research testing part, not, not involving any testing in humans, some um, did use fetal cell lines in the very early stages. Uh, so in fact, all of, the, all of them had uh, fetal cell lines used in the very early stage of, of development. And then there are fetal cell lines that are used in vaccine production for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine not for Moderna and Pfizer. And I wanna be really clear um, with what I'm saying, what is a cell line versus what is a fetal cell? So these cell lines are developed, um, the, the ones that are used in Johnson & Johnson, for example, the cells were taken from a fetus in 1985 in the case of the, the cells used in Johnson & Johnson. The cells were taken from a fetus, they were multiplied and replicated in a lab over generations and generations of the cells. And that, that turned into a cell line. So none of those cells are, are really the original cells that came from the fetus, but they've been um, replicated and multiplied over cell division generations. 
And then that cell line is used in, in research and development in the case of Johnson & Johnson in production. So now in 2020, um, the generations, you know, thousands of generations of descendants of those cells um, are used um, to, to make basically the, the virus that um, is used in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that, that grows well in these cells. Um, for Moderna and Pfizer, there's no part of fetal cell lines or um, any fetal uh, products that are used in manufacturing the vaccine itself. The fetal cell lines were only used in the earliest phases of testing um, and safety to, to understand what kind of um, effect it has, uh, the vaccines have on human cells. And for comparison, that same kind of early base, you know, laboratory testing that's done on uh, Moderna and Pfizer with fetal, fetal cell lines, those fetal cell lines are used to test almost every prescribed medication or over-the-counter medication that we have. So that same kind of testing process that, that was used for Moderna and Pfizer was used for Tylenol, aspirin, Lipitor, remdesivir, which is a treatment for COVID, ivermectin, which is not a treatment for COVID, metformin, lidocaine, Prilosec, pretty much any, any medication you can think of has been tested on, on fetal cell lines. So that's the degree to which it's involved. And uh, the, the Pope, the Catholic Church, and many other religious organizations who are all very opposed to abortion uh, have all given uh, license to, um, for congregants and uh, observe, observant folks to, to receive the vaccine, um, given the, the overwhelming balance of um, necessity and, and be able to, to protect humanity uh, that comes from that. Um, so uh, I hope that offers some reassurance to folks who are concerned about uh, aborted cell lines. So safety, bottom line, is the vaccines are incredibly safe. They are not 100% safe because nothing is 100% safe. The top pot donuts that I brought into clinic today, not 100% safe. Um, in terms of the what we, excuse me, what we know about vaccine safety, over a billion people have gotten the vaccines. They've been extensively tested in hundreds of thousands um, of folks in the US who have participated in clinical trials. Um, we know that there are, with, with all of the vaccines, there are common mild short-term side effects right after getting a vaccine. So things like arm soreness, maybe some mild fever, chills, feeling kind of crummy for a day or two, uh, but then that those go away. So they're, they're short-term. They, they go away quite mild, um, and, and those are common. Almost everyone who gets a vaccine experiences some um, side effect uh, of, the, of the mild variety. There are some extremely rare and very serious side effects as well. And these are side effects that occur within hours of getting the vaccine, up to eight, about eight weeks after is, is the longest you would expect to see any of the serious side effects occur. And these serious side effects are things like allergic reactions, anaphylactic reactions. Um, the J&J &J vaccine is associated with a rare type of a blood clot, which can be quite serious. Um, and the, uh, the mRNA vaccines may lead to an increased risk of a certain kind of heart inflammation, uh, of inflammation of the lining of the heart or the heart muscle itself. I should say that the, uh, even the most serious of these, the blood clots and the heart inflammation are rarely fatal, uh, especially now that we know that it's a possibility that they may occur. We have the ability to recognize and treat them appropriately if they were to occur. Uh, the vast majority of people who experience heart inflammation recover from that heart inflammation with no long-term sequelae from that. So it is, it is not the, there have been one or two uh, I mean, I don't want to say one or two. There have been small single digit numbers of people who have died from these rare and serious side effects. Um, but compared to the literally billions of people who have received the vaccine, um, it's, it's much safer than getting into a car. Um, 
And I, I also want to, to reassure folks that there are no long-term side effects. It's actually not even a thing that happens with vaccines. So if, if a side effect is gonna happen, it's gonna happen within the first eight weeks. No vaccine in the history of vaccines has ever had a, vac uh, a side effect show up two years, three years after getting the vaccine um, and have, it, have that be the first time it shows up. So if something happens, you're gonna know about it in the first two months. Um, and you know, just for, for perspective, when I say rare serious side effects, these heart inflammation uh, side effects, it's about 12, per, uh, 12 cases of that happening per, per million vaccines. So really, I mean, incredibly rare. Um, and I, I, the, the comparison, and I think this gets to one of someone's specific question is, you know, what's, the, what's kind of the trade-off of the risk of the vaccine versus the risk of COVID? COVID is incredibly dangerous. I mean, you folks have really been at the front lines. I don't need to tell you that people get incredibly sick. Uh, many people get very sick. COVID itself causes blood clots and heart inflammation at 20 to 30 times the rate uh, that, that what you would see with um, the, the risk from a vaccine. So you really don't want COVID. Uh, people need to be hospitalized. There is long-term permanent organ damage and disability that comes from COVID. And even for the many folks who have relatively mild cases of COVID, uh, they can still get long COVID, which is prolonged symptoms, um, often shortness of breath or kind of a brain fog, um, really a wide variety of long-term symptoms that don't go away for months. Um, there's, there are some folks who have long COVID and we haven't seen them get better yet. So um, the, the, the risks of COVID are, are real and profound and on balance, it is a much, much, much greater risk of death or disability from COVID than from the vaccine. So it, it's really not an equivalent trade-off. Um, vaccines are overall very, very safe and COVID, even if COVID doesn't put you in the hospital or if it doesn't kill you, it can make you sick and it can give you long-term permanent damage from even a mild illness. And we see that even more so in, in younger folks, in fact. So then to some questions of, you know, what, what are we doing with vaccines? You've all had PPE, isn't PPE enough? And why should you get vaccinated if you've, if you've had COVID and have immunity from COVID? So I think um, my, my brief answer is that PPE, it's good. You should use it. If, and if that's all you've got, you should really, really use it. Uh, but vaccines give you an extra layer of protection that can't be guaranteed with PPE alone. Uh, I, I work in Harborview Hospital in Seattle sometimes, and, and we've seen cases of um, hospital staff who are always masked, always wearing PPE, ending up getting COVID from a patient who was not masked at one point in the room. So PPE is, is great. It prevents a lot, but it's not perfect. And you wearing PPE does not guarantee that other people are going to wear PPE. And if you're responding in an emergent situation, you have no control over what the folks you're going to encounter are, are wearing and using if they're doing it properly. Um, and so having that extra uh, protection from the vaccine is, is key. That's, a, it's your, it's your uh, long-term insurance policy, whereas the PPE is sort of a short-term umbrella your flood insurance, uh, where the PPE is, is an umbrella that's probably just gonna blow out in Seattle winds anyway. Um, and then I think I'm really glad somebody asked the question of why should you get vaccinated if you've had COVID and have immunity from COVID? And that's, that's a, the answer to that question. We were really very indebted to the, uh, the Everett Fire Department folks uh, who were part of the study that Julie Sartosky led that showed how, how immunity works from COVID infection compared to COVID vaccination and which combinations lead to the best degree of protection. So this is this slide is taken from a, a colleague of mine um, who did a similar kind of town hall. Um, and she pointed out that the immune response from an infection is, is really not predictable. Some people do develop very good protection, but many folks don't. And the protection that you get from a, a COVID infection may go away at some point and in with timing that we don't we don't really know and there's no good way to check um, you know you don't want to be taking 
sending off blood to a lab every week saying, do I still have it? Do I still have it? Is it, am I still protected? You just, we don't know how, how that's going to work. Uh, and the other key point of that is that the immunity you get from an infection is going to be much more specific to that infection and less general to protect against the variants um, than, than what you see with the vaccines, which protect better against the variants of concern, including Delta. This is a little bit of a frightening slide. I have to admit, when I first saw it, Julie sent this to me. Um, I got a little concerned, um, but I'm going to walk you through it because this is, this is the data of, um, from folks in Seattle, Everett, King County, Snohomish County, Pierce County, who participated in a study. And Julie and her group and our lab colleagues asked the question, uh, so these dots, these dots show the levels of antibodies um, and the amount of antibodies that, um, that reduce uh, the um, infection if, if in a lab they're exposed to COVID. So this, these first four, these first floor, at yeah, first four graphs here show the level of immunity, so the level of antibodies um, that folks had after an initial COVID infection. So there's some, and you can see these, these clusters of, of squares show decent levels at the kind of hundred level of, of titers uh, of antibodies. And then this is what happens, this next set of four colors, is what happens after those folks who were infected got one dose of an mRNA vaccine. And you just see the titers shoot up. I want to point out the scale. This isn't a one, two, three, four scale. This is going up by powers of 10. So you're going from levels of kind of average around 100 uh, after vaccination up into the 10,000s. Uh, sorry, levels around 100 after infection to up around uh, 10,000 after one shot of an mRNA vaccine. So this is kind of a superpower. Um, it, you, you really boost your immunity and your antibody levels if you get vaccinated after a COVID infection. Um, this is what happens on the right side is the graph that shows what happens um, to people's antibodies, people who were not infected and then get vaccinated. And you can see that um, folks who are not infected, they have no antibodies, understandable. And then they get two doses of an mRNA vaccine and the antibody levels jump up. And they jump up a lot, but it's still not quite as high. So really, if you, if you were infected and then you get vaccinated, you've kind of won the immunity lottery because the highest immunity we're seeing is in fact in people who, who were infected and then get vaccinated. You obviously, the ideal would be to not be infected at all, but if you are infected, capitalize on that by boosting your immunity even further with vaccination. All right, so I think I've covered most of the, the key COVID-19 um, infection and vaccination qu content questions. And now I'm gonna go to the ID infectious disease and epidemiology bonus round, the questions that ask uh, some about the vaccines, but really ask about some infectious disease questions in general. So one question was, uh, and I love this. this, this takes me back to my um, epidemiology PhD days of, of working out these questions in, in lab and in lecture. So one question was, if all the COVID-19 cases that are reported are only measured by the number who tested positive, doesn't that mean that there are a lot of undetected cases, people who never tested, in which case the case fatality rate and the case hospitalization rate are actually much lower. So this is a really astute question. That is absolutely true. So the denominator, the true number of cases, we don't, we don't have that measured because or we don't have that reported because many people who have COVID don't get tested. So their numbers can't get reported. So that's the denominator of cases. What we do know, what we have really good numbers are on the, are the numerator, the number of people in hospitals and the number of people who die. So it is true that of the observed reported cases, the true case fatality rate, the true case hospitalization rate is lower because that did not, the true denominator is bigger than what we see um, than what is, than what is re recorded. But the estimations that we make of case fatality rate and case hospitalization rate don't just come from reported cases. Uh, it also comes from surveillance testing where we go out and we 
uh, test people who are asymptomatic. We test uh, folks who don't want to get tested, you know, who weren't planning on getting tested by themselves. And that gives us a sense of what is the true population prevalence of COVID, who's actually getting COVID. And then we can use the numerator um, that we see of people coming into hospitals and, and people dying uh, to, to more accurately estimate the case fatality rate and case hospitalization rate. So through a combination of some modeling and some surveillance testing, we do get pretty accurate estimates of, of how serious things are. Uh, but whoever asked this question is 100% correct that many people, particularly people with no symptoms, who don't know if they had an exposure, are not getting tested. Um, and we see that when we look at blood donation data, we, we look and see who's, who's been exposed to COVID. And it's more people than we have a positive test for. All right, so someone asked another really great question. Why aren't there vaccines for coronavirus that cause the common cold? Uh, there's been all this work for COVID, but uh, the common cold has been around much longer. Why don't we have a vaccine for that yet? So I think there are a lot of different factors that go into this. I'm gonna keep myself to just two or three points because I could talk about this a lot. One is an issue of priority. The common cold doesn't kill many people. It doesn't cause serious illness. And so as a priority for developing a vaccine, it's not, a, it's not that high a priority. Uh, certain kinds of viral infections like colds do cause death, like influenza, and we do have a vaccine for that. But common cold, not that serious. And so the, the impetus to develop a vaccine, not, not as high. Uh, the other major region is that a vaccine that um, worked against coronavirus would still not be that effective against the common cold because there are over 200 kinds of viruses that cause the common cold. So a coronavirus vaccine would take out some of them, but for the rest, it probably wouldn't do anything. So things like adenovirus, rhinovirus, uh, parainfluenza, on the order of 200 other kinds of viruses would still cause the common cold. All that said, there is work being done right now in developing a pan-coronavirus vaccine that would be effective at preventing uh, infection and disease, both from COVID with SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses. And so we may actually have at some point a pan-coronavirus vaccine uh, that will prevent against that. We'll still probably have the common cold because of those other kinds of viruses. And then this last question, which um, again, I'm gonna have to keep myself short because uh, I could again talk about this for hours. Um, outside of COVID, what do you see as the most impactful thing in the world of infectious diseases that's on the horizon for first responders? Uh, I know that as first responders, you're always thinking about what is, what's the next crisis? What's the next thing we need to expect? And that is so great. That's why we have, that's why we're prepared and that's why we've made it through. Um, as far as we have. So I think things to think about are um, both the unknown, so the next viral respiratory pandemic, which is probably not going to be the flu this year, but it might be the flu in a few years from now um, if we get hit with a particularly bad strain of pandemic influenza. Um, and first responders are always going to be at the front lines and people getting sick um, and having problems at home. So thinking about viruses and infections that are transmitted by breathing, the easiest thing possible. Um, those, are, those are always going to be things that first responders need to be thinking ahead about. Um, Bloodborne infections. So uh, as first responders, you're also encountering people who are injured, cut, bleeding, and like with, like with COVID, use PPE. With bloodborne infections, you use universal precautions gloves, uh, making sure that you don't come into contact with, with fluids. Um, but I do think that, you know, we, we see a lot of hepatitis um, in, in the community uh, and hepatitis is highly transmissible through blood. Um, we're doing a great job in the world of infectious diseases of treating people with hepatitis and curing hepatitis C, uh, but we still don't have a cure for hepatitis B and that's very transmissible. So uh, thinking about the, um, the kinds of vaccines you can use to protect yourself. There is a great vaccine for hepatitis B. And so continuing to uh, protect yourself with uh, against things that we have vaccines for and doing your best with PPE against things we don't have vaccines uh, for, uh, but we have treatments for like hep C. And then HIV is something else where it's not 
uh, there's not a, a huge number of cases in the Seattle um, Snohomish area of, of HIV, but it's out there and it can be transmitted through blood, blood contact. Um, and fortunately, we were making a lot of progress um, with an HIV vaccine. That's another thing that Julie Sartowski and I spent our, a lot of time working on is, is other vaccines. So we have hope for that. Um, hopefully not a huge issue for first responders, but something that we certainly want to keep thinking about. Then the, the last, um, I'll just get my last um, point in about things for first responders to be thinking about in the infectious disease world is bacterial infections for which we don't have good treatments anymore. So re right now we have antibiotics that treat a variety of infections. And I know that first responders, by virtue of your job, you're at risk for uh, traumas, bone injuries, bone breaks that may require surgery. Surgical sites get infected with bacteria. Uh, you're at risk for um, all kinds of trauma, smoke inhalation, which then makes your lungs be at risk for infection on top of that, which can be with bacteria. And again, right now we're, we're pretty good. We've got antibiotics, but there's a lot of antibiotic resistance developing. And that's, that's the thing that keeps me up at night uh, once I've gotten to sleep after a, a, a day of, excuse me, COVID, COVID care, um, is the fact that while our antibiotics are good now, um, in 20 years, 30 years, I, I don't know how many antibiotics we're going to have. And so um, doing, doing our best with responsible prescribing, using of antibiotics, not, not taking antibiotics for things that they don't work for, um, and making sure that uh, antibiotic courses are fully completed so that resistance doesn't emerge. So those, those are my two cents on things that I would, I would think of first responders needing to keep a particular eye out. All right, so that takes me through my slides and I'm, I'm gonna apologize in advance um, that I, I haven't actually seen on my view any, any hands go up. So I, I really apologize if I've missed a hand. I'm opening up my Zoom view to see if there are any. But I think right now I wanna open it up. Um, I think first I wanna throw it to, to Julie Sartoski and see if she has anything she wants to add, especially about um, the immunity after, after uh, infection and vaccines. And then let's open it up to see what questions I can answer for folks. Julie? Yeah, thanks Adrienne, that was fantastic. Um, so uh, that uh, slide that Adrian was showing earlier um, that was going over, those were, those were some of you are in there. So those were folks that were part of our cohort study. And we looked at the first folks that got vaccinated after they had had COVID. And then we compared them to folks that hadn't been vaccinated or hadn't had COVID and got vaccinated. And one thing that uh, was also in that slide, it showed that the um, for folks that had not been vaccinated and had not had COVID, the the F there on the yep right there. Uh, in our lab, we tried to infect those cells with uh, different strains of COVID, and everybody who had not had COVID and had not been vaccinated yet were able to be infected with every strain. And that's really important because, you know, we've heard about this term novel, vi novel virus, and it means that we don't have any, we don't have any natural defenses. We, we haven't seen it before and we're all really vulnerable. And that's really important and why uh, it's scary for people who, who are looking at data like this, because if we were to do this with flu, you wouldn't see it so clearly that everybody was able to be infected. Um, because, you know, flu has been around, we've seen it. Some of us have, you know, some level of something there. Um, but that's just one point I wanted to bring up. Great. Oh, great. Um, looks like Barry Klarman. Do you want to un unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes, got it. 
Great, thanks for the presentation. Uh, so you addressed um, the vaccine and the virology. So we have um, other concerns. It's more like OSHA type concerns, but you know, which isn't necessarily your your field per se. But um, there's been a lot of um, concern about uh, accommodations, like how, given the the virulence, as we just heard, 100% if you expose, um, and the uh, all the immunology you just talked about. Given that, what? reasonable accommodations can be made given the governor's mandate. So we're, we're told, I'm not trying to throw the chief under the bus, but he's, he's telling us there's no accommodations he's willing to do. And um, we have different facilities. They're not exactly the same in terms of uh, the layout, of course, and our behaviors aren't exactly the same either. And so um, yeah, it's, it's a tough position to put you in, but um, you know, it's a question that needs to be asked in your, is there any accommodation that's reasonable that given the way this virus behaves would work for people who aren't vaccinated being mixed with people who are vaccinated in a fire station, in the same rigs, that sort of thing. And, and if you don't feel comfortable answering that, I understand. I, I guess I wanna make sure I'm, I'm understanding the question of what you mean by accommodation. I mean, I think, I think you hit it really well on the head that um, it is, it's not a good idea for unvaccinated people to be mixing with vaccinated people um, because of the risk of, of transmission of COVID and people who are unvaccinated have, so one, one point I didn't really touch on too much was that um, people who are not vaccinated, who get COVID uh, can transmit it for much longer than people who are vaccinated. And so it's, um, I think the combination of uh, needing to have vaccines, and then also PPE, because vaccine doesn't entirely prevent against infection, does a very good job, but but not entirely. So PPE is kind of the second line after the, the insurance policy. Um, I, I guess I'm not entirely clear on, on what kind of accommodations you mean. Um, and then I, I may ask Dave for some for clarification if, if this is something that, that I should go into. Um, yeah, I, I think that you answered the portion of the question that you could and that there's multiple factors for there, there's multiple agencies represented here that have multiple considerations they have to make on whether they will exempt someone from the governor's mandate. And, and that leads into a risk management question that Dr. Shapiro can't answer. Um, and so for that portion of it, we're going to have to leave that part of the question behind Barry. I completely understand. I just didn't want to leave that not asked. I, I totally understand. And, and one other question, just to hog it, since I'm on here, um, if you is there any increased risk for your vaccines if you have an autoimmune disease? Any, you know, just that sort of. So that's a any, great not question. Not anyone specific, just a autoimmune disease. No, it's it's a really great question. Um, the so uh, the the very simple answer is no. There is no additional risk. Um, to having uh, to getting the vaccine if you have an autoimmune disease. What there is an additional risk of if you have an autoimmune disease most likely is of getting COVID. Most people who have autoimmune diseases have um, are on immunosuppressing medications to treat an autoimmune disease. And we know that those medications can um, make the person much more susceptible to getting really severe COVID if they get an infection. So the, um, the, the strong recommendation almost universally is that if someone has an autoimmune disease, especially if they're on immune suppressing medication, is that they get COVID vaccination and they may even need a third dose of an mRNA vaccine um, because two doses may not be enough um, if they're on, if they have a really suppressed immune system from, from medication. Um, but you know, it's a great question and it's, 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 a, it's a question that is a really active area of research. Um, and folks who specialize in treating autoimmune diseases are doing a lot of research to look at responses to vaccine, risk from vaccine. But the, the policy of the, the American College of Rheumatologists, which is the kind of the, the senior professional body of the doctors who, who treat autoimmune diseases uh, is that they, their patients should be prioritized for getting the vaccine. They should absolutely get it. There may be some niceties, some, some fine points about 
timing of getting a vaccine compared to if you're getting a dose of an immune suppressing medication. That's a not going to go into the, the details of that. And that's a discussion to have with the, with the doctor who specializes in treating autoimmune diseases. Um, but no, no, no excess risk from the vaccine. Feel free to put your hands up the button. If you wave the mouse around, the button is at the bottom. For the Everett Fire folks that are on duty, uh, if you would like to uh, exit at this point, you're welcome to do that. If, if no one else has a question, uh, Dr. Shapiro, oh, uh, Chris Chapman's got a hand up, so I'll stop. Go ahead, Chris. Hello, this isn't Chris. I'm just using his computer. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm asking for a friend. Um, I, I was gone for part of this. So my question would be uh, to the doctor, what is your big concern of having an unvaccinated population brush up against the vaccinated population? Um, what, is, what is your worry? And why can't we just say, well, if you're vaccinated uh, and you happen to get it, you're less likely to get as ill as a vaccinated person? I think the issue is it's, it's a great question. And I think the issue really comes down to folks who are unvaccinated are at a higher risk for themselves of getting sick because if they're unvaccinated and then out in the world, they, not just not just in the workplace, but you know you you encounter folks out in the world. Um, they're much more likely to get both infected with COVID and then have serious illness. Um, and even if they don't have serious illness, if they get infected with COVID, then they'll hang on to it. That they they have the virus for longer and can infect it infect other folks with it for as long as they're shedding virus. So it's not a question of mixing unvaccinated people with vaccinated people. It's a question of the risk of being unvaccinated, um, full stop. But, but we as individuals assume risk on any number of things, whether it's our car insurance, house insurance. And if this is just another risk, do I risk getting the seasonal flu or not? Uh, for some people, that's a big deal, uh, especially somebody that has underlying conditions. Um, why, why can we not just take this risk as all other risks that we we assume, and and choose what we feel comfortable with? Yeah. So I think part of it gets to the fact that it's it's not just an individual risk. It's not just the risk of the person making a decision to be vaccinated or not. It's the risk of every person that that person comes into contact with, sometimes unavoidably. Um, and the fact that, you know, if an, even if an individual decides, hey, I'm not at high risk of severe disease, um, they, they're, if they're not vaccinated, they are, again, more likely to get COVID, more likely to pass it on to someone else. And their decision about their own vaccination has no impact on how serious that COVID is gonna be for someone else. And so that everyone else they come into contact with um, is taking on the risk that, that they didn't choose. So it's, it, it, it gets to be a little bit more, it, it's, a, it's a bigger question than just making the, the one decision for oneself. Um, and then I guess I'd also point to some of the, it's, it's not just the folks you come into contact with, one of the big consequences we're seeing with COVID is, and this is this is as true as it is here where we have relatively good, um, relatively high vaccination rates as other places, our hospitals are filling up, our ICUs are full. And it means that it's not just a question of our, our folks with COVID uh, needing hospital beds, it's that um, you're, the folks getting COVID who need hospitalization, which you know, if they need hospital care, they should get hospital care. That, that blocks off those beds from other folks um, who need them for non-COVID reasons. And it's, it, it's a, a spill-on effect of people not being able to get 
diagnosed with cancer, people not being able to get treated for heart attacks in a timely manner. Um, and you know, these are things that, that are directly something that, that folks in fire departments are directly familiar with. If you're taking someone from your rig to, to an emergency room, um, their chances of doing well are directly proportional to how full that hospital is. And, and that itself is related to how, how vaccinated the community is. So it, it, it's layers upon layers. Um, and I'll, it, but it's a, it's a long dis discussion that uh, I, I'm gonna cut off my answer here. Thanks, Tom. Uh, there's an Eric. Eric, if you could uh, give your full name and agency and then ask your question, please. Yes, uh, Eric Schweiger, um, captain with uh, Camino Island Fire and Rescue. And uh, thanks, Dr. Shapiro, for your presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, we hear that the Delta vir uh, variant is peaking at this time and other waves have peaked. What causes that? And and uh, is that a natural progression? Great question. And I, I will be very transparent and say I am not uh, the absolute best person to answer this. Um, I will say in, to some degree, yes, it's a, it's a natural progression. Uh, what causes it is in some ways, it's sort of like a forest fire. There's a little bit of um, how, how much it's burned through a susceptible population. Uh, at some point, um, it's you know, encountering either an, enough people are vaccinated so they're protected or used with PPE and, and non-pharmaceutical interventions, social distancing has gone up, um, or it's, it's just kind of running its course. I mean, we see this with the, with the flu every year. The flu is seasonal. It comes in expected peaks. So the short answer is yes, it, it was expected to peak at some point. Um, it does look like we are hitting the peak now. Um, and we've, we've been um, caught off guard a few times before. So I, I, I really don't wanna get too ahead of myself, um, even with the support of some of the, the mathematical modeling data that, that does think that we're headed on a downward peak. Uh, Cause we, we thought that once before and, and it turned out it was a very local local de decrease and then it went up again. So uh, short answer is yes, I think we are hitting the peak, but it doesn't guarantee the future six months down, certainly not, certainly not six months and not even three months down the line. Um, and I, I don't have the expertise to go into a, um, a, a lengthy or, or good discussion of, of what causes the peaks beyond that, but great question. And, and I really appreciate the question. Thank you. I would direct you to um, one, of my, uh, one of our colleagues at the Fred Hutt, Trevor Bedford. Uh, if you follow his Twitter, he does a lot of kind of explainers about um, viral dynamics. And uh, I can probably dig up a couple web resources um, to, uh, to send out. Awesome, thank you. Dr. Shapiro, there was a study I was reading today uh, or news out of Singapore, at least, and it's a country of, of about 5 million, 80% vaccinated, and, and it was based on what it's going to look like when COVID-19 is endemic in the population, kind of how we've moved from the pandemic stage to endemic. Uh, any thoughts on what that will look like here in the United States? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a day I look forward to because we're still really very much in the pandemic part of things. Um, but but one, one kind of thinking of it is that at some point, and I'm really hesitant to say when, um, people will either have been vaccinated or been infected or both, and there will be some level of uh, immunity in the population so that when the next wave or variant comes through, people will get sick, but it will look more like the common cold um, and not not the kind of ICU filling, um, hospital overflowing, high death rate illness that we're seeing now. So that's, that's sort of my, my vision for it becoming endemic, uh, which, which still relies on a uh, good uptake of, of vaccinations because um, it, about that, it's gonna cause more than, more than just mild illness, but, but probably to a point where there's mild illness and that that some change in the variants um, will be okay if enough people are vaccinated. Because as we're seeing, the vaccines 
are pretty protective against, against uh, variants, even ones that they weren't developed for. So people, you know, um, people will have some level of protection for how long. Will, I think there are really good questions to be asked about, will we need more boosters down the line? And I, I don't know the answer, nobody knows the answer to that yet. Um, but I, I suspect we will enter a, a phase where um, COVID looks more like, hopefully looks more like the flu, um, you know, because we, at, right now we, we live with the flu each season. It causes deaths, um, but we as a society and in the U.S. have decided that 60,000 deaths a year, you know, on that order, that's something that we as a society have decided to accept. Um, so I think, well, you know, there's a big difference between 60,000 a year and 650,000, uh, which is what we're doing with pandemic COVID. So that's, that's my crystal ball prediction. And then to follow up on your, your talk about there's no long-term side effects that pop up from vaccines. They don't, they don't appear 10, 20, 30 years down the road. That's, that's been consistent with all vaccines. With all vaccines from the history of the first vaccine ever, if there's going to be a side effect or a negative effect, it's going to happen within the first two months. You'll know about it. And are there similar vaccines that are that are currently in use to the Johnson and Johnson that use the adenovirus version? I'm trying to think, um, and I may ask, I may phone a friend with Julie. I, I can't think of any current commonly used um, adenoviral vector vaccines. Um, for non non COVID, um, Julie, I don't know if you're still on. If you if you've got my back here, but um, yeah, it, it, I can't think of. I was just talking about this the other day, and I don't think so. Yeah, I, it's a it's a really um, commonly used technology in developing new vaccines. So there are hundreds of vaccines in clinical trials now that use adenoviral vector. Um, but I, I don't think there are any in, in common use that do that. There, there are some vaccines that we have that use something similar, uh, something called a virus-like particle, which is components of a virus, um, but not the actual virus or even a modified virus itself. It's a self-assembling um, protein shell of parts of a virus. So the, the HPV vaccine, the human papillomavirus vaccine uses these virus-like particles. So the, the outside looks like a viral shell. The inside is DNA similar to an adenovirus vector. Um, and it acts like a virus, but it, since it's just self-assembled viral pieces without actually being a virus, it, um, it doesn't, it can't hurt you. It can't replicate. It can't cause illness itself. So I, I think that's the, the closest I would say to, um, to an adenoviral vector that's in use currently. And that one is in use and is incredibly safe and has already saved thousands of lives from cancer. I don't have any other hands up. Does anybody care to ask another question? Uh, Jonathan Bowes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So I have a question. So I know I am unaware of any uh, asymptomatic cases. So as far as a pre-symptomatic case goes, do you know what the risk level is or the statistical probability that someone who is pre-symptomatic, how many hours until they are infectious or have a large enough viral load to infect someone else? So thinking that if I you know, as a person had an interaction and I got infected, what the timeline is until I would know by symptoms that I am potentially infectious towards other people as a guideline. And I know that's a rough estimate depending on viral load and conditions and immunization or not. Uh, but I'd be interested to know your thoughts on that time frame and the statistics for probability for being infectious to others? Yeah, great question. Um, so setting aside asymptomatic infections, which are definitely a thing, we, we know that there are some people who have infections who are even transmissible to others, but themselves, they never have a symptom. Um, 
uh, putting those aside, if you're thinking about someone, what is the what is the incubation period between getting infected and developing symptoms and becoming infectious to others? Um, and re recalling that we know that people can be infectious to others in that pre-symptomatic period before they develop symptoms. So it's usually on the order of like four days, four to four to seven days um, before somebody would have symptoms, if they're going to have symptoms. Tran um, infection, yeah, so, so being infectious, it's probably on the order of three to five days between when, when I get infected and when I'm able to give COVID to somebody else. And that, that range could go probably as high as seven days. Um, if I have a really low viral load, it'll take longer for it to replicate enough to be transmissible to someone else um, to as high as, as maybe even less than three days. But I think the, the stats that we're looking at have things around a three to five day uh, incubation window. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Sean Maxwell, you had your hand up briefly. Oh, oh now can you hear me? Yes, yeah. you got it. Okay. All right, I started talking too soon. Have you had a chance, a lot of people keep pointing to a new uh, preprint out of Israel where they're indicating that natural immunity was better than vaccine immunity. Other than, I, I know it's a very small sample size. Do you, can you uh, comment on any nuances or, or, or looked at the, the reliability or validity of that study? Yeah, no, great question. I've, I've glanced at the preprint. I haven't seen it in detail, um, but, I, but I have seen it. I know the one you're talking about. And I, I think really that the take home that I took from that uh, paper which is one that the, the authors, the scientists themselves said, is, is not that it's better to be infected than to be vaccinated, but that they also had that third group in the paper, those folks who were infected and then vaccinated, who were the most protected. Um, and the, the real takeaway was the best protection is, is probably infected and then vaccinated. So if you have the bad luck to be infected, then at least you, you can derive the benefit from then getting vaccinated after that to have the most sustained and highest level of protection. Perfect, yeah. I did see some of the similarities against the research you were doing. Yep. Well, but thanks. Sure. Okay, any other questions for Dr. Shapiro? All right, we've uh, consumed a solid hour. Dr. Shapiro, um, thank you uh, very much. Um, all of us are uh, appreciative of the, of the service that you provide um, and, and very much appreciate you taking time out of your, your personal life to come and talk to the firefighters in Snohomish County, so thank you. Well, I wanna thank all of you. I appreciate the attention, the attendance, the questions. Um, and I, for those of you who have uh, heard us talk about the research and have been interested in participating, I, we're, we're so grateful for your participation in that, as well as grateful for the services that you provide in our community. Um, there's, there's only so much that uh, we can do with, with uh, the resources that we have and uh, your, your, your team and teams um, really are absolutely at the front lines. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that service and in keeping us safe.